All right, I'm going to start my skills. That way we have lots of time to learn about how, how to train for the moon. <laughs> my name is Veronica and I am the Outreach and Events Liaison here at Idea Exchange. The chat room is open, so if you want to say hello, let us know where you are watching from. If you're a class, say hi or a homeschool group. Um, that would be wonderful. Uh, the chat's going to be open for the whole program. So if you need to reach out for technical support, I am there to help. Um, my advice is always, if for whatever reason, you all of a sudden can't hear anything or can't see anything, is to sign off of Zoom and to sign back into Zoom. Um, that tends to be the cure-all for Zoom problems. At the end of the program, there's going to be time for some questions. So if you have any questions at all, you can either put them in the chat room or in the Q&A section if you are watching on Zoom. If you are watching on uh, YouTube, you can use the chat room there and I will make sure to bring your questions over for Cassandra. Uh, without further ado, I would love to welcome Dr. Cassandra Merle for joining us. Uh, she is going to be talking about an expedition, an expedition to train for the moon. Um, we're super excited to have you and uh, we can't wait to listen to your talk. Thanks so much, Veronica. I'm so happy to be here. Uh, so I'm Cass, everybody. And uh, I'm from I'm speaking to you from Ottawa today. Uh, it's uh, just an absolute pleasure to to be a guest on this fun program that Veronica's uh, got organized for you all. And um, so I'll tell you a little bit about myself. I'm the science advisor, which just means sort of the in-house scientist at the Canada Aviation and Space Museum in Ottawa. Uh, and my background is I'm a geologist, a planetary geologist, which just means that I study rocks on Earth, but also on other planets and moons in the solar system, which includes our moon. Uh, and in particular, I like to study meteorite impact craters, so giant space rocks that hit other space rocks, essentially, and the hole that it makes. Uh, and those craters that I focus on are, tend to be in the Canadian Arctic. And uh, speaking of which, uh, last September, I had the privilege to participate in a geology expedition, uh, so an expedition to study rocks in Northern Labrador, which was led by Western University, where I did my PhD. Uh, and this was to help train two astronauts, including one Canadian astronaut, Joshua Kutrick, who's in blue here in the image. This is me in the center. And NASA astronaut, Matthew Dominic, who's in black here. And we're standing on, the, on a hill in an impact crater in this image. And I'm going to tell you all about this place. Um, so, so the whole point was really to take them out there. There was some research going on as well. Uh, but to tra train them to be field geologists uh, to prepare for future missions for the moon, because we're going back. And when I say we, I mean, you know, the global community, but that includes uh, Canada as well. So we're going back to the moon and, you know, we're, we're doing a bunch of different things to prepare for, for the different missions that are being sent. Uh, and this is just one, one of the many. Uh, so today, today I'm going to tell you about our expedition. And then we can, you know, talk about Canada's role in these upcoming missions to the moon at the end. Uh, before I get too much into it, I just wanted to make a land acknowledgement and acknowledge uh, that Ingenium, which is the, the museums, as well as my home where I'm talking to you from today, are on the traditional and unceded territory of the Algonquin Anishinaabeg people. Uh, and also the expedition itself took place in Northern Labrador uh, on Mushuao Inu lands, uh, a territory that they call Natasanin, and the expedition would not have been possible without uh, their wonderful support. And so uh, I thank them for that. So this is where our destination is. So if you're looking at this map here, you've got Canada up top and the US is down here. And this big yellow star is where we were in Northern Labrador. This is Labrador and uh, Newfoundland. And so I've sort of cut this map off and put, the, put it on the side here. So this uh, yellow star is the same thing as this red box. And now I'll zoom into that red box. And this is the lake where we were at. So this is Mistastin Lake. We were camped on the west side of the lake. The lake is about 19 kilometers long. So it's pretty large. Um, and what you can't see here is sort of where the hills and dips and valleys are. And so if you can imagine, there's actually a big ridge all the way around this lake. But what makes this lake very special? It's not an ordinary lake. This is actually an impact crater. So 38 million years ago, uh, an asteroid, a big space rock, probably 
some three to five kilometers wide, collided with the earth in a really energetic uh, event and it broke rocks up. Uh, it melted them because it was super hot um, and it turned some of the rocks to lava and it excavated, it dug out this hole and ejected some of the material way up into the air and some of that trickled down and was redeposited in the crater, in the hole and some on the outside. Uh, and so now what you have is that, that hole in the ground is actually way out here, the edge of it. So the rim of the crater is actually 28 kilometers in diameter and the inner part is filled with water. And so now I'll point out too that there's a, you know, a large island in the middle. And there's a reason for that it kind of has to do with how craters are formed. Um, so what's special in addition to being an impact crater is the rocks that were impacted here in Labrador they're called anorthosites, and they happen to be the same type of rock that makes up the bright white stuff on our moon, um, which we call the, the lunar highlands. So I'm going to show you a picture of the moon. This is sort of what the ideal full moon would look like. Uh, tonight, it's more of a half moon if you want to check out the moon tonight to, to compare what, what we talk about today. Um, so you'll see just this half. Um, but so... Looking at the moon, you can see it's made up of some dark stuff, some white stuff, and all of these circular features, which are scattered. There's thousands of them all the way around. So the dark stuff, that's actually ancient lava flows. Yes, there were volcanoes active on the moon millions of years ago, uh, and they erupted. They just gushed out lava and filled these huge basins with this uh, basalt, if you call it, but this dark type of rock. The white stuff, that's the anorthosites, like Mistastin's rocks, um, we call those the lunar highlands because they're more mountainous and they have far more impact craters, which is what those round features are. They're, the moon is covered in impact craters because of billions of years of bombardment by space rocks. It just chewed up the surface of the moon. And so near the south pole of the moon, that's where we're hoping to send people back to the moon. And that's the dominant rock type that's there is the white stuff, the anorthosite, which is same as Mistastin. So all of this to say that it's got Mistastin the lake where we, we did our expedition has the same rock type. It's an impact crater, which is really common on the moon. And so it makes for a really great spot to train astronauts. And if I take this impact crater right here, this is called Tycho and I zoom in, um, this is kind of what Mistastin would look like uh, if it hadn't been eroded you know, from millions of years, covered in vegetation and filled in with water. So uh, this is very similar structurally, or, you know, the look of it to Mistastin. And so you can imagine that this inner part here would be the lake. And we're going to be walking as we're exploring uh, around the lake shore in this inner rib part. So uh, now you have an idea of where we were within the crater, although it's not evident when you look at the picture of the lake. So who went? We were uh, a crew of geologists, uh, five of us, an archaeologist. Uh, he made sure that we didn't trample any uh, sensitive sites. And we had two Innu elders, which are the local indigenous. Um, they use this territory for uh, spiritual and, and hunting uh, retreats. Uh, and of course, we're all sandwiched between the two astronauts, uh, Josh here and Matt there. And so my role on the expedition, and I'm there in green, uh, is... I was part of the astronaut training team, which was led by Dr. Ozinski, who's standing there. Uh, and since this was my sixth expedition to this site, because I had done a lot of research there here in the past, um, I took on the tone of a field guide. I helped manage the camp. And I also helped document the expedition so I could share it with uh, wonderful groups such as yourselves. So although we were a big group, most of the time during the day when we were out doing research and doing training, it was just this smaller group of the five uh, geologists and the two astronauts uh, led by Dr. Zinsky there. So to give you an idea of what that training and expedition looked like and how we lived in the wilderness, I'm gonna uh, go through a few slides with some pretty pictures. So how did we get to this crater? Because we were really far north uh, in the middle of nowhere. There's no roads out there. There's no communities that live close by. Um, they only you know, fly in temporarily for, for hunting and fishing. And so it took me three flights from Ottawa just to get to Southern Labrador. And then we had to charter a twin otter flight, which is this plane here, which I'll show you a video of its landing on our airstrip 
So this is uh, astronaut Josh here in the foreground. And this twin otter, it's like a bush plane slash cargo plane. Uh, it's a really amazing aircraft. It can land and, and take off on really short runways and on the, you know, the most bizarre uh, type of land. Like this is all gravel and shrubs and it's bumpy. Um, you know, there's no pavement anywhere and it can land there no problem with its very skilled um, pilots. We also have the very first one of this aircraft um, at our museum too, uh, if anyone's interested in, in air aviation. So very cool. Oh, yeah, I'll move on to the next. So right behind where Josh was standing was actually where we set up our camp. And it really was just like camping, going on a, on a camping trip, except for it was a two week camping trip, trip instead of you know a weekend um, of fun. And it was a, a work camping trip. So we had two large tents. One of them is our kitchen tent. It's where we cooked our food and stored it. And then the other large tent is our gathering tent. So it's kind of like the dining room. And then it had all of our technology, you know, solar panels, charging instruments and things like that. And then all the little tents over here, we call that tent village. That's where everyone sleeps. And then there's a, a little cabin up here. And that's actually the elder uh, Inu cabin uh, where they use for, for their hunting. And so they, they stayed there just on the lake shore. And in the background, you can see how large the lake really is. That's the other side of the lake way over there. And this is the island in the center. So we had a lot of ground to cover, uh, but it's quite a beautiful place. What do we eat? We had a variety of foods. And if you can imagine, I said it's kind of like a camping trip, but you can't really take a freezer or a fridge with you. Um, and we had, so we had to take foods that wouldn't spoil after two weeks, right? So it was uh, not a lot of fresh food, it was actually a lot like space food because a lot of the foods were prepared, dehydrated, freeze dried or canned ahead of time. But you can see what we still ate really well. You know, we had delicious spaghetti and tacos. Um, the, the local, the, the Inu, they caught us some fish as well as the archeologists uh, to fry. So we did have some fresh food, um, but you can see that we ate really well um, our sort of space-like long-term camping food. But I'm happy to answer any, any prep questions about food uh, later if you have any. It's one of my favorite topics. Um, and how do we get around? Mostly we're just on foot hiking around, uh, but we also brought a Zodiac with us. I have a little time lapse of us putting this boat together. So as I said, everything that we needed to do the expedition, we had to bring it in on that little plane that you saw. Um, and so everything had to be broken up and rolled up and packed up really, really tight to be able to fit. And so we had to put the boat together when we got there. And then when we left, we had to take it back apart and take all the air of it, roll it all up. Um, and so this is just an example of how many people it took. And uh, it took a little while. Also, the, the engine was being a little temperamental. So uh, eventually it got us to where we needed to go. So the training itself, there's two types of training that we uh, provided the astronauts. The first is just expedition training. And that's really the whole experience of going out into the wilderness and doing science. We're in a remote and challenging environment. So it was really cold uh, some days, some days it snowed and some days it was like summer, but the waters of the lake is always very cold. On um, some days it's really, really windy. Uh, and when the wind's not there, it was very buggy. Um, you know, there's a lot of physical dangers, uh, there are, there's wildlife that you have to be careful of, and you have to live, you know, with a small group of people all by yourselves, and you're dependent on your teammates for success, and at the same time, you're expected to deliver, you know, great science uh, and do these, this exploration. So that's really very, very similar to a space mission, where it's a small team, they're very isolated, they're under intense, challenging conditions, but they also expected to do really important science. So it's a great uh, experience overall. And the astronauts actually do a lot of different types of expeditions, not just geology, but they do cave spelunking and they go and stay in underwater, underwater research stations and things like that to, to prepare themselves for these types of um, situations. And then um, the other type of training is immersive field geology training. So really, we wanted them to become geologists, rock scientists, uh, and to learn how to think uh, like a rock scientist. You know, astronauts in general, they have very different backgrounds. Um, Josh and Matt that were with us, they're actually test pilots and engineers. And so rock's really not their thing. Although um, 
becoming more and more their thing. Um, and, you know, astronauts, they can be medical doctors, they can be astrophysicists, biologists. Um, there's, there's a wide variety, and some are geologists, but not many. Uh, and they, they receive all sorts of different training. Uh, they really have to be really well-rounded to be able to do what they got to do in space. And so these two pilots uh, are becoming geologists for two weeks. They received two weeks of in-class training before coming on the next expedition over, over a period of two years. And they also did, I think, one weekend in the field um, in, at, at a site in the U.S. before coming here. So they really are uh, new to the field of geology and new to cratering as well, to, to studying the rocks in an impact crater. So we just wanted to give them the right skills and the tools so that if they were chosen to go on one of these missions to the moon and they got to walk on the moon and they had to collect samples to bring back, uh, that they'd know how to do that. They know, you know, they'd know what they were seeing. They'd know how to, which samples they should collect, you know, what, what are best to take. They're not going to have very much room on the spacecraft to take those samples back with them. Uh, and, you know, and all of the geologists back on Earth are like, you know, really excited to get the samples back. But, you know, there's there's some that are more important than others. And so we just wanted to get them to a level in which they could do really good science in just a very short amount of time that they might be on the surface uh, and and with a very small amount of space that they'll have to bring rocks back. So the first thing we got them doing is just exploring and familiarizing themselves with the rocks. And this is a perfect example of that. This is Joshua here, astronaut Josh exploring this big outcrop of rock, this big rock face. And I'll tell you a little bit about this because it's a really cool um, outcrop. Um, and it's really, um, they're, they're, these are not common uh, on earth to have this great of an exposure of this type of rock. Um, so this is actually what we call a melt rock. I had told you early on that some of the rocks melt because of the intense heat. So you can imagine a big pool of lava, molten rock. Um, and it's flowing from the inside of the crater in the middle to the outside. And as it's flowing, all of the rocks that were broken up underneath, it's like pulling them up and incorporating them into its flow. And so that eventually cools down and solidifies and it becomes this new rock, which we call melt rock. And you can even see the big hunks that it ripped up as it was flowing. Uh, we call those clasps. You can see them sticking out in the outcrop. And so that's what Josh is learning about in this image. Um, most days we'd wake up every morning, we'd have breakfast together in our big tent, and we'd have a discussion. We'd plan out our day, you know, uh, depending on the weather, depending on how, whether the boat was cooperating or we wanted to go on foot, how many groups would we split into. And we planned out our day, planned out our path using images that we took from the area from space. We call it orbital data, just like they would on the moon. Um, and we also use topographic maps. So we plan everything out before we set out for the day. Mostly we explored rock exposures uh, at Miss Daston. So a lot of them are like we just saw before along creek beds. And in this image, you can see there's, there's an exposure along a creek bed and cliff sides. So there's a big cliff. Usually there's rocks that are exposed there. This creek here is Cote Creek. And you can see this is um, our lead Oz and the two astronauts here. And behind them is this big white cliff. And those white rocks, those are actually uh, brecciated rocks, broken up rocks um, of that same type of rock, like moon rocks. And you can tell it's actually really similar to the color of the white stuff on the, on the moon. Um, because it is, it's like basically moon rocks, uh, but in Labrador. So cool, that, that, that picture. Um, so we had discussions at every outcrop. So, you know, we'd walk up to a brand new outcrop. Remember, the astronauts had never been there before. Um, and we'd say, hey, what do you see? Describe to us what you'd see. You know, being a geologist, the main uh, part of the science is being an observer. And you describe everything that you see before you make a decision on what you think it means. So we had discussions. What do you think it means? Um, what kind of textures do you see? Is there something that stands out to you? Um, and, you know, we really had them voice what they were thinking. And anybody can describe rocks, whether they're using, you know, scientific words or not. And you can still describe it in your own way and still have that be very valuable. We also explored some really difficult places to get to. Uh, the terrain was, you know, some very different and difficult in some places. Uh, this, this is one image, it's called Discovery Hill, which I was standing on top of in the very first intro slide. And uh, we're collecting some rock samples here. As you can see, you know, in the background, there's some areas that really forested and some areas that are open. 
Um, it's, it's quite a mix. But one day we went on, for example, a 20 kilometer hike and it was zero degrees outside and it was pouring rain the entire day. And it was so much fun. <laughs> um, the, the conditions were miserable, but the team was great. And we made so many different discoveries of new rocks that I hadn't seen before in, in uh, my many years having been there. Um, so those are some of the best days. We definitely uh, discussed what samples are important to collect and why and how to go about collecting those samples. Um, I will point out that the, the instruments that we use to collect samples, we weren't trying to simulate the instruments that they would have on the moon. They're going to have very different instruments on the moon, but the ideas are the same. You know, to the, what sample to collect is the same. So we wanted them to just be a, a, an earth geologist first, and then, you know, in future training, they're going to be able to learn the actual instruments um, that they'll be using in the future. So you can just... Uh, just an example though is generally we have a hammer and a chisel and we have a little magnifying glass, which we call a hand lens. Um, those are the basic tools for, for collecting things. And in the end, Matt and Josh were really amazing students. Uh, they became really comfortable with the rocks and the processes. Um, they developed a geological skill set, and I'm really confident that, you know, if they're chosen to walk on the moon, they'll come back with a great set of samples. And you can also see them using those tools I talked about. They also used uh, um, a program and, and an iPad, so basically a tablet computer, uh, which had a, a, a program on it that helped them, you know, go step by step, taking their coordinates down, taking the right images and describing the rocks that they, they saw. Um, so they also use that. And that is a tool that they will have something similar uh, on the surface of the moon. Um, and I just wanted to point out, so that's, that was the, my last expedition image, but I thought I'd talk a little bit about what kind of training they've been doing and what we're doing uh, going forward to the moon. And so Canadian craters, impact craters like this one, this is not the first time we've taken astronauts there. In Apollo 16 and 17, which were the last two missions 50 years ago that uh, we sent, you know, that NASA sent astronauts to the moon, they actually trained in Canada too. They trained at the Sudbury impact structure. And yeah, Sudbury, Ontario is actually another big impact crater. It's one of the biggest in the world. Uh, and they, they had their astronauts train there as well. This is Jack, um, actually Jack Smith did go, but this is Charlie Duke and John Young. And we also, in the last 10 years, we have been training our Canadian astronauts in Canadian craters. So, uh, and I got to be on some of those expeditions as well. So this is me in the center here with Oz again, with the same expedition lead. Um, this is Jeremy Hansen. Uh, these are two different craters that, we, that he's been to. He's actually been on four expeditions now. Um, and these are both in the Canadian Arctic. One's on Victoria Island and the other's on Devon Island. And this one's in Northern Quebec and this is uh, David Saint-Jacques. Um, and I'll show you a picture of our Canadian astronauts. So I was talking about Jeremy Hansen and Josh who's on this trip and then that's David Saint-Jacques. And the fourth Canadian astronaut, her name is Jenny. Um, and she's hopefully gonna be going into a Canadian crater uh, next summer if all goes to plan or our plans. <laughs> um, to do her training as well. And so they all, they're all on different schedules, but hopefully we get them uh, all in Canadian Craters training and, um, and continue to do so for future astronauts. Um, so these are our four active astronauts. Um, we have many retired astronauts as well. So one of these four, uh, excitingly, is going to be on a, a future mission to the moon, which I'll tell you about in just a second. So most astronauts these days, they go to the International Space Station when they go to space, just like David Saint-Jacques did in 2019. But as I said, new options on the horizon. This is the space launch system. It's a giant rocket. Uh, that's part of what's called the Artemis program, like the Apollo program, but the new version, they called it Artemis. And it's a multi-mission program, which means there's lots of different missions that are planned for it. But the whole idea is we're sending humans back to the moon. Uh, and this is the rocket that's going to take them there. So this rocket is carrying a little capsule. This is all rocket. And the people, the astronauts, are actually just in the little, this little small section in the top here in the Orion capsule. And if I zoom in, it's actually this little guy here. Uh, so they're in this top capsule here. And part of this program as well is to build a new space station, but not around the Earth, around the moon. So it's going to orbit around the moon, and it's called the Lunar Gateway. Um, and Orion will come and dock with Gateway. Uh, and then another spacecraft will take 
uh, they'll sort of switch and get into a lander and, and they'll go down to the moon that way. Um, that lander is probably going to be SpaceX's starship if, if anyone's really into rockets. Um, but what Canada's role here for this space station, we've made an agreement that we're going to build Canada Arm 3. That's a robotic arm for this new moon space station, which is kind of a smaller version of the International Space Station. Um, and currently on the International Space Station, we have Canada Arm 2 and Dexter, which are two different types of robotic arms, um, which have been you know, running for, for years, uh, operating for years on, on the space station, doing wonderful work. And so in return for building Canada Arm 3, we've been granted two seats uh, to the moon through this Artemis program. And coming this year, um, they're going to be sending the very first mission to the moon. It's not going to be uh, crewed, so there won't be astronauts on board, but it's going to be this Orion spacecraft and this rocket. And it's going to send Orion around the moon to orbit the moon and come back, but it'll be empty. And they're basically just testing the spacecraft, making sure it's safe and they've got their math down pat. Uh, and then in 2024, uh, so less than two years, they're going to put four astronauts and do the exact same trip around the moon and back. And one of them will be Canadian. We haven't chosen which of those four, but it will be one of them that will be going around the moon. And then the third mission uh, in 2025, they're going to land uh, the first woman and the first person of color on the moon. So really exciting times coming up. I'm super excited to like see all this on the news and follow. Um, it's such a great pleasure to have been a part of, you know, to contributing to this space exploration in, in my small little way. Um, and I also should mention that Canada is also going to be sending robotic missions. And we are in the midst of designing our very first lunar rover, uh, which is, you know, Canadian built. We built the rover and we built one of the instruments on board. Um, and NASA is going to help us launch it. And it's going to go to the moon in 2026. So exciting times. And I will thank you for listening. I'd love to hear all your questions. Uh, I'll just say that this is an image of uh, our camp at night. And so um, it was one of the only beautiful starry nights I had. So thank you. Thank you. OK, so make sure to write your questions in the chat room or the Q&A. Uh, we do have one from Alex and Andrew who said, who is who's uh, providing the landing module? for the moon? The landing module for the moon. So um, as it is right now, they've given the contract to SpaceX and SpaceX is testing right now. Has, it's actually supposed to be tested and sent into orbit around the earth uh, for the first time this year and this spring um, coming soon. So it'll be, a, it's a giant silver rocket, even bigger than the one <laughs> I showed you. And that'll be the, the landing. Um, the landing rocket. So it'll it'll connect to Lunar Gateway empty, and then the astronauts will climb on board and it'll go down. But it's just, it has to be powerful enough to take back off from the moon. And that's uh, that's the, the key for the, the lander that we're, we're planning on. Um, we have a student asking, how, how long does it take to fly to the moon? That's a great question. So it takes about three days, three to four days. Uh, in the Apollo days, that's how it took, how long it took for us to do a mission to the moon. This time around, we'll actually get to the moon in about the same time, but um, when they go from that gateway space station uh, down to the surface, will take a little bit longer um, just because of how it's, how it's planned out. Um, but if you were gonna go from a straight shot from Earth to the moon, three days. Amazing. Uh, what is your favorite part about exploring craters? Oh, I have so many favorite parts. Okay, I loved, I grew up, uh, you know, both loving camping, canoeing, and I spent most of my summers in tents. And so I just love the expedition part about it. Um, I also just love exploring and I like learning new things. And I've also loved, you know, thought rocks were cool. And of course, I was a Trekkie too. So when I get to mix the idea of, you know, a linkage to from space, to rocks, I'm in my happy place. <laughs> How long can astronauts walk on the moon for? So what, what is the time period that they can actually walk on the moon? Um, so right now, the EMUs or the, um, the spacesuits that we have, they uh, have oxygen that lasts for about eight hours. So let's say you, you land and you exit the spacecraft and you're just walking in your spacesuit, the spacesuits last about eight hours um, without needing to be, you know, refill the oxygen tank, so to speak. 
Um, but in the sense that, you know, the end goal of these Artemis missions, we're actually planning to have sort of a permanent base eventually on the moon. And so they're not going to just be in suits, we're going to build habitats. Uh, and actually, by the end of this decade, there'll be the first habitat sent up there. And so people could stay a lot longer because they'll be in a much, they'll be in like a little room, like kind of like a big tent, like one of these big tents, uh, but much with uh, a lot thicker walls um, with the, where we provide the press, air pressure and we provide the oxygen in there. So they'll be able to last a lot longer than, than the eight hours in there for sure. So we're hoping that they can stay, you know, long periods of time. Amazing. Um, how do you eat in the rocket as it's going to the moon? <laughs> That's a really good question. Um, I'm not sure how they're doing it this time around, uh, just at least for the Orion capsule. But I can tell you uh, in Apollo days, so the, the, well, we've made huge improvements on the type of foods uh, that we used early on when people were, you know, just getting into space. And now the space station food is actually quite good. But most of it is eaten out of like a little bag. If you've ever had one of those apple sauces where you squeeze and it comes out the little mouth and you just squeeze it into your mouth, a lot of the foods are very much like that. Um, and then you, you know, if it's, let's say it's spaghetti and meat salt, meatballs, it'll be in this little baggie. And then you add water, you add water, hot water to it. It rehydrates the food. And then you can either like slurp it or, or eat it with a spoon. Um, so usually it's, the food is prepped like that for the actual trip uh, like that's in the, at the space station for the trip on the orion capsule it'll probably be foods that they don't have to change very much um you know so it might be add water it might just be like dried foods and foods out of it out of a tube uh, because they won't have very much space it, it looks really small <laughs> It looks, I would be so claustrophobic if I was driving in that for three days. <laughs> it, it is small, but it's bigger than the Apollo capsule. Like it's, it's quite a bit bigger. It fits another whole person and there's definitely a little more wiggle room. Amazing. Where do you know where they're going to be launching the rocket? Oh, that's a good question. Um, well, it'll be one of two places, either probably from Florida would be my guess. Um, yeah, it's probably going to be from Florida. Okay, amazing. Um, okay, so we have one with two questions. So when the capsule comes back into orbit, do, you, do they know where it's going to land or is it kind of <laughs> anyone's guess? Uh, they do know where it's going to land, but there is, you know, there's wiggle room. It's about where it's going to land, but it'll land in the Pacific Ocean. Oh, probably. cool. So um, that's they usually do is when it comes back down. That way there's a lot of room for error. <laughs> uh, and then the last question, because we're almost we're at, almost out of time, is um, okay. Where is the Ro Rowan capsule doing its vacuum testing? The Rowan capsule. Oh, or Orin? Orin, sorry. Oh, Orion. Orion, um, sorry. The Orion capsule. Uh, it's vacuum testing. That's a really good question. Um, I'm not entirely sure. I think they're. I think they're partly in Houston. You know, NASA actually has. Um, it's being built by NASA and uh, its its partners, um, which are you know company partners, but they have installations all over the states. So there's one in Houston, there's one in Florida, there's one in California, um, there's one I think in Maryland, and I I always forget which one's which, but I'm gonna guess that it's probably somewhere in Houston or, um, that they're they're building this thing and doing all that that type of testing. Amazing. Well, thank you so much, Cass, for taking time out of your afternoon to talk to us. It's so interesting, and I can't wait for the next couple of years to see what is going to happen <laughs> um, and to be able to actually see people walk on the moon. Because um, I wasn't, I wasn't around when they did it the last time. So, and Me probably <laughs> nobody in the audience was either. <laughs> at least all the little wee ones weren't. Um, so, thank you for joining us. My pleasure. And thank you to the, all the classes and kids and big kids uh, for joining us today. Um, I'm going to send out a email with upcoming programs. Um, next week, we are going to the ROM and we're going to be talking about why science is such an amazing subject and why is it so interesting and so important. So I will send that link out to you as well with a few other ones. Um, stay safe and enjoy the sunshine um, and we will talk, see you next